Hey, People's Church, we are excited for another great time of worship today, united by God's Spirit from all over our city and globe. Wherever you're tuning in from, we are so glad you're chosen to be here with us. If you are new to the People's Church, we invite you to connect with us in our live chat. And you can check out the connection opportunities we have by clicking on the links in the video description below. We also have worship experiences specifically for our kids. So if you are a part in joining us, we invite you to check those as well. We are excited for all the ways we can gather as one body from multiple locations. As we continue to grow in our faith together and share the love of Jesus in our communities and world. Let's prepare our hearts in prayer as we head into a time of worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit willing in us today. We thank you for your word, for this beautiful time of worship that we are going to have ahead. I wanna pray for that your word can dwell in us and we can move uh, guided by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Sing praise the Father. And praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit. Three in one. Oh God. Father. Ever to the King of Kings. Hello, church. What a privilege, what a blessing to be able to come together to worship the Lord, the fruit of our lips giving thanks. Giving is another opportunity to worship the Lord. And as we come to the Lord with our tithes and offering, let's be thankful for what He's done for us. Let's remember how He provided for our family through this season, how He blessed us. But also let's bring our seed to the kingdom, that that seed may be used to bless others, to bless others in our communities, but also throughout the world, through our global partners. There's three ways you can give to the church. You can give to the church app. You can use the, uh, go to the church website. You may also send your gift to the church by mail. February is Black History Month. Since 1926, Black History Month has been celebrated across North America. We at the People's Church are celebrating Black History Month because some of our values include diversity, compassion, relevance. We have over 100 nationalities that are making the People's Church their home. And that includes many of African descent, whether they were born in Canada 
or came here in the past few years as immigrants. So celebrating Black History Month is the time to celebrate the diversity, the diverse tapestry that the Lord has brought us here at the People's Church, including all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues coming together in unity to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, as described in Revelation 7, 9. As we look at church history, we actually understand that much of Western Christianity was influenced by what happened in Northern Africa. Ethiopia is mentioned over 40 times in the Bible, from Moses' wife Zipporah to Queen of Sheba, from Simon the Cyrene who helped Jesus carry the cross on the way to crucifixion, to Candace, Queen of the Ethiopian, to Martin Luther's relationship with Deacon Michael, an Ethiopian cleric, to William Joseph Seymour, who in 1906 was influenced in the Azusa Street Revival that actually led to the rise of the Pentecostal and Charismatic movement, we can see how people of African descent have influenced the church, his, the church growth throughout the ages. So as we celebrate Black History Awareness this month, let's take the time to learn about our history, whether it's our church history or even the history of our country, thinking about the Black Loyalists who came to Nova Scotia in the 1500s. So as a community of gospel-centered, globally-minded Christians here at the People's Church, let's celebrate, let's pray, let's rejoice for what God did through His people. And let's come together in unity and pray and join Jesus in His prayer in John 15, 17, 21, that we will be one, united in the spirit of in the divine trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So I would invite you to join us this month as we celebrate Black History through a variety of activities. Join us in prayer as we pray to our We Pray series. You will find the We Pray playlist on our church YouTube channel. You may also join us at the end of the month as our People's Church Caribbean Fellowship is organizing a virtual celebration of Black History with poetry, songs, historical highlights, and a special speaker. You will find the detail of this event on the church website. And I will not forget next week, we also have a guest speaker who will bring us an inspirational message. Now today I have the privilege to introduce Charles Price, which is well known to the church and need no introduction, but some of you may have joined us for the first time. Charles Price is a gifted Bible teacher who has been the lead pastor here at the People's Church for 15 years. And since 2016, he's been traveling across Canada and the world, bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Charles has been married to Hillary for over 40 years, and they have three adult children and at least four great-grandchildren. So let's prepare our hearts before Charles brings the message, today's message. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Father, that you have been so good to us. You have blessed us with such a diverse and beautiful family here at the People's Church. And as we celebrate Black History Month this, this month, may we join Jesus Christ in his prayer in John 17, 21, that you would make us one, that you would knit our hearts together in unity so that people would know that we are children of God. We pray that we will stand in that prophetic voice that you have given us to bring healing, peace, truth, and reconciliation to our nations that so needed it today. We thank you, Father God, for Charles as he brings the word of God. Anoint him afresh, Father. We pray that you will prepare our hearts to be good soil to receive the seed of your word. And we know that the entrance of your word brings light. So we thank you for lives that will be changed today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to read in just a moment from 2 Corinthians in chapter 12. But before we do that, just a few things to set up the theme I want to talk to you about. Yesterday I was on a Zoom call with about 120 other people in 40 different countries of the world. It's a network that I've been involved in for a number of years, and uh, I joined them yesterday for this particular conversation. What intrigued me 
was that in every single part of the world, everybody is facing exactly the same thing at the same time. Never in my lifetime, certainly, probably not for centuries, have we ever lived in that kind of environment. It's usually been that over there, somebody's got difficulty, uh, or they over here, or maybe you, or maybe it's me personally, but never has there been a global us in the way there is right at the moment. Never have we all faced the same threat at the same time, characterized by the same uncertainties, dogged by the same fears, asking the same questions. And uh, I want to read a verse to you before I go to 2 Corinthians that is the springboard of what I want to talk about in this respect. Because... To be honest with you, I plan to say absolutely nothing about COVID and its effects. Everybody's talking about that, we've trained that, we think dry, but my heart couldn't get away from this particular theme I want to speak to you about. So in Hebrews 12 and verse 2, here's the sentence that's going to be the launch pad. The writer says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as Sons. That's Hebrews 12 and verse 7. The word discipline is related to the word disciple. Disciple means to be a student of. Discipline, amongst its varying, various uh, meanings, involves mental, moral, or physical training, according to my Oxford Dictionary. It sits on my desk at home. And so a disciple is discipled, therefore, by being subject to discipline. And the writer of the Hebrews says here, you're facing hardships. These are means of discipline. Therefore, these are means of discipling us. And so I want to talk about this by reading 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Chapter 12 and verse 7 down to verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. And Paul, of course, is writing and he is speaking now about something very personal in his own life. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now the key in this statement of Paul is verse 7, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Now he doesn't tell us what it was, he describes it as a thorn in the flesh. So it's Likely it was something physical. And over the years, people have tried to speculate what it might have been. Some have suggested it was poor eyesight because when he wrote the Galatians, he talked about that and and the fact that uh, some of them would have gouged out their eyes and given them to him if they could have done. So was it his eyesight? Others suggested it was migraines, headaches, stammers, earache. There'd be many, many suggestions that people have made on the basis of things that Paul writes. Was it something physical? It may have been. Was it something moral? Paul uses the word flesh to describe the old nature in the New Testament as well, that old natural ass that with its, with its uh, tendency to sin. And is Paul saying that he's struggling with some temptation uh, that he is constantly battling with, what we call a, a besetting sin, a recurring sin? Maybe. He wasn't exempt from those kind of things any more than you or I are exempt. In fact, Paul wrote about those who are overcoming a sin 
and, and their need to be restored gently. Could it have been something circumstantial? We don't know. It could have been a difficult situation he was living with. Was it his singleness? We know he was unmarried, but he also talked about the fact that uh, there are other apostles who had wives, and, and don't we have the right to take a believing wife with us? He had said to the uh, Corinthians in the first letter to them, Someone said it could have been the fact that he'd been married because as a Pharisee, normally a Pharisee was married. And maybe when Paul became a Christian, his wife left him. Paul wrote about that kind of situation in 1 Corinthians when he says that uh, if a couple are married and one becomes a believer and the other one wants to leave, he says, well, let them go. If they didn't sign up for this and they don't like the fact you've become a believer, let them go. Maybe that was his own experience. And when he says, for the sake of Christ, he'd lost all things, maybe he'd lost a wife and children as well. We don't know. And I'm glad we don't know because if Paul had specified what the thorn in the flesh was, if, for instance, he said, uh, I have very poor eyesight, that's a thorn in the flesh to me, we would say, well, here's a verse for everybody who has poor eyesight. But he doesn't define it because one size fits all. What Paul is talking about here is applicable in any situation that you and I may face that we say of it, if only that thing could be taken out of my life, I'd be a much better person. Do you have something like that? Do you have something where you feel many times if only that could be removed? If only this pain could be taken from me, I'd be a much better person. If only I had a different job, if only I was able to earn more money, if only my kids could go to school during this shutdown period, if only COVID could be removed, if only my wife could change, if only my husband could change. I don't know what if only you might have in your life but you probably have something. Now, Paul doesn't tell us what it is, but he does tell us where it came from. He says it is a messenger from Satan to torment me. He is unambiguous here. This thing is evil. It's come, he says, from hell. It is satanic in its origin. It is evil in its intent. John in 1 John 5.19 says that we know that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We're living in a world that is Satan's domain. We often throw out glibly statements like, you know, uh, God is in control. Well, there's an ultimate sense in which God is God, but in this world, in this life, we're told the whole earth, the whole world is under control, the evil one. It's the evil one who writes the newspaper headlines, not God. Jesus called him the prince of this world three times. And so... Paul doesn't just say, this is some unfortunate instance in my life. This is a messenger of Satan. This is intended to be, be destructive because he tells us what it did to him. He says, it was a messenger of Satan to torment me. It torments me. Now, if you read 2 Corinthians uh, through carefully, you'll find that uh, in this letter, Paul talks about torment and struggles and hardships all the way through. This is the most autobiographical of Paul's letters. And he talks a lot about himself and a lot about his hardships. Let me just point out a few words that he uses of his circumstances in chapter 1, from verse 3 to 2. He talks about troubles in verse 4. He talks about sufferings in verse 5, distress in verse 6, endurance in verse 6, the sufferings we suffer in verse 6. He talks about sufferings again in verse 7, about hardships in verse 8, about pressure in verse 9, about being in despair in verse 8. He talks about death in verse 9, about the deadly peril that's following him in verse 10, his need for deliverance in verse 10. I mean, these are 
adjectives that he uses just in those few verses, extremely discouraging, and all of them about himself. In chapter 2, verse 4, he talks about being in great distress, in anguish of heart, having many tears. In chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, he talks about being hard-pressed on every side, about being perplexed, being persecuted, being struck down. In chapter 6, he talks about the fact that in serving Christ, he is in great endurance, in troubles, in hardships, in distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, in riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, going through hunger, subject to dishonor, given a bad report, genuine yet regarded as being an imposter, known yet regarded as being unknown. He is beaten, he is sorrowful, he is poor, he has nothing. All oh, that's in chapter 6. And then in chapter 7, he talks about having no rest, being harassed at every turn, having conflicts on the outside and fears on the inside. And in chapter 11... He gives a long description of the sufferings that he's going through, where he compares himself with some pseudo-apostles who've come on the scene who who are claiming that Paul is not real because uh, uh, he has struggles, and they say a real apostle would be free of all of this. So, So he says, no, my struggles are the evidence of being a true apostle. He says then, verse 23, are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this, but I am more. I've worked much harder, I've been in prison more frequently, I've been flogged more severely, I've been exposed to death again and again. In other words, he says, if they claim to be apostles, how many times they've been in prison? How many times they've been flogged? How many times have they been beaten? Verse 24, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one, that's the 39 lashes, where every uh, strip of leather had a piece of bone tied into it or pieces of bone, and every time it lacerated against the back and the victim would tear out chunks of flesh. 39 stripes, and I've been through that five times. Apparently, you are not recognizable once you'd been whipped with the 39 stripes. He says, uh, three times I was beaten with rods. That's just rods, just beating me with sticks. Once I was stoned. We know about that. He was left for dead in Lystra. And when he came round, he went back into the city. Uh, They left him there thinking he was dead, but he was in some kind of concussion. Back into the city, I would have gone the other way. And I think he probably stood up and said, ladies and gentlemen, I was telling you something important when when you stopped me. Now let me get on with it. And uh, so he says, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. Seems most times he went on a ship, it sank. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. I've labored, I've taught, I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst, I've often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. And besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who's weak? Don't I feel weak? Who's led into sin? Don't I inwardly burn? And then, on top of all of this, as if that wasn't enough, and I have just read to you 68 descriptions Paul gave of his troubles and turmoils, and if that wasn't enough, he says, now there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Satan has been let loose on me and is tormenting me. So what does he do? Well, he says in verse 8, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Now, Paul's solution there was the instinctive, instinctive solution of most of us. And that is, let's pray it away. Lord, take it away. I pleaded with the Lord three times I think that probably means over three periods of time, he pleaded with God, take it away. That's a knee-jerk reaction. Most of us, when trouble comes our way, let's pray our way out of this. I get lots of emails, newsletters, some telephone calls. I read mystery magazines. And if people talk about 
that difficult is often it is pray, in effect, pray that God will solve this for me, that God will deal with this. And of course, we pray. But prayer is not a one-way conversation. Paul's ears were as open as his mouth. <laughs> and so he listens. And he says, I prayed that the Lord would take it away from me. But he said to me, he talked, yes, but he listened. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. God's reply to Paul's prayer is, Paul, I'm not going to take this away. I know it's painful. I know it's satanic. I know it torments you. I know it leaves you weak. But Paul, I have a vested interest in your weakness. It is in your weakness that you become dependent. And it is in your dependence that you become strong. But it's not your strengths. It becomes mine. Paul, it is your strength that is your problem, not your weakness. Take it away. Why? So that I am strong, comfortable. It's easier. Paul, that's the trap for you to become self-sufficient. In your strength, you may become independent. Paul. I've given a title to this message and I've called it Don't Just Pray Your Way Out of Trouble. Pray, of course. But we don't just pray our way out of trouble. There sometimes is a deeper agenda, a more significant agenda where our trouble becomes an agent in God's deeper and richer purpose. Because God meets us in trouble in a way he doesn't when things are going easily. Some of the greatest lessons that we learn, we only learn through struggle. It puts our roots more deeply into God. You see, Paul's roots are sinking deeper here. His instinctive response, Lord, take it away, take it away. That's the natural response, it's my natural response. But Paul has listens and he realized his roots have to go deeper than just a God who will solve the problem and go into his grace. My grace is sufficient for you. Somebody quoted Tolkien yesterday in this uh, Zoom call that I was on. Tolkien, uh, I think it's in uh, one of his books, says it's the shallow roots that get killed by the frost. It's the deep roots that survive. And the Lord is saying to Paul, in effect, Paul, your roots need to sink more deeply than into a God who will answer your prayer, but into a God whose grace will be sufficient when I don't answer your prayer. And so Paul's response to that then is in verse 10, when he says, that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. Those 68 things I read to you before, Paul could say of them, I delight in those things, not because I'm a masochist, not because there's virtue in suffering in itself. No, he says, 
I delight in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The very thing I thought was weakening me is the agent to strengthen me by driving me back to God himself. And Paul's perspective changes. My weakness is not my enemy. My struggle is not my enemy. My thorn is not my enemy. It's my friend because it drives me back to God. And so, as he said in chapter 11, verse 30, if I must boast, I'll boast of the things that show my weakness. Because this is the workshop of God in my areas of weakness and struggle and difficulty. So he says in chapter 13 and verse 9, we are glad whenever we are weak. I don't want to be for one moment insensitive to circumstances you may be in, struggles, the tears you may have shed. As I prepared this, I wanted to steer away from it in case it felt a little bit cold. But there's something very wonderful here, that in our weakness we find strength, we find the grace of God. Let me finish with an example. I read this in a book by Larry Crabb, and I've followed it up since. He quoted a man called Albert Ellis, who's a well-known psychiatrist. And Albert Ellis specialized in the theory of emotions. Why do we feel the way that we feel? And he came up with an acrostic, which he called the ABC of our emotions. He said, there's A, the activating event. Something takes place in your life. There is B, a belief about that event. Then there is C, the consequent emotion. Now says Ellis, it is not the activating event that causes the emotion. It's what you believe about the event that causes the emotion. You can't go, he says, straight from A to C. Let me illustrate. This is his illustration. He says, two men are caught in a rainstorm. One is mad. The other is glad. Two completely contrasting emotions. You say to the man who's mad, why are you so mad? He said, because it's raining. You say to the man who's glad, why are you so glad? He says, because it's raining. Now they both blame the same event for a totally different emotion. But Ellis says, it's not the event that is a cause of the emotion. It's what they believe about the event. You see, one of them is a golfer and the other is a gardener. And the golfer is mad because this rain spoils my game of golf. The gardener is glad because this rain will make my plants grow. Now says Ellis, the important thing is not the events that come into our lives, but what you believe about them. Now he's not advocating a kind of positive thinking about everything. You've got to be realistic. But what is real that I can believe about this? And Paul is... In Paul's uh, passage here, what has changed is not the event. The event has remained the same, but what he believes about the event. So first time round, Paul says the activating event is a messenger from Satan. It's a thorn in my flesh. What does he believe about that event? It torments me. It needs to be taken away. That's what he believes. What's the consequent emotion? I'm dissatisfied. I'm praying, take it away, take it away. That's the first time around. Then God speaks to him and he says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. So the second time around, the activating event is exactly the same. It's a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan. But what does he believe about that event? That's what changes. What he believes is this, that God says, my power is made perfect in your weakness. So what's the consequent emotion? He says, I delight in my weaknesses. And 
And if you and I can see the perspective that Paul has learned, we can look at all the things that are oppressing us and we're struggling with, and some of them are bad, of course. Some of you are going through marriage difficulties. Some of you are going through traumas in your family life. Some of you are grieving. Some of you are in financial difficulties. Some of you may have lost your job. Some of you feel that the things that you hoped for have fallen over the horizon. But when you bring it to God, what does he say to you? In this very area, my grace is sufficient, which doesn't just mean you can passively hang around and sit there, but I have an agenda here. I didn't, he wasn't the source of the agenda. He wasn't behind the thorn in the flesh. Satan was behind that. But God has the agenda in that. So that Paul can say, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses in verse 9, so that Christ's power may rest on me. And then in verse 10, that's why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Whatever you're facing, there are things in our lives we do have to bring before God. We have to repent of things in our lives that are wrong, but we bring them with all the damage that may have been done and say, thank you, Lord Jesus, your grace is sufficient here. Out of this weakness, you can show yourself strong. And that's why going back to where we started in Hebrews 12 and verse 7, that's verse that I used as the launch for this. And your hardship is discipline. God is treating you as sons. The hardship in your life is a discipline that makes disciples as it drives you back to him. There's a hymn by Edward Joy written about 100 years ago now. Some of you may know it, but most of us probably don't. And it says this, Is there a heart overrun by sorrow? Is there a life weighed down by care? Come to the Lord, each burden bearing, all your anxiety, leave it there. And there's the refrain, all your anxiety, all your care, bring to the mercy seat, leave it there. Never a burden he cannot bear, never a friend like Jesus. Because the wonderful thing about the Lord Jesus is he takes our tears and they become more precious to us than our laughter because we learn more from them. We learn in our hardships what we never learn in ease. And his answer is not to take it away, but lead us to a greater dependence on him. Of course, if we don't come to greater dependence, we might come to bitterness towards him. That's why it's in humility we say, Lord, in this difficulty, this trial, this circumstance, I want to trust you and thank you and find you, your grace, your presence to be sufficient. Let's pray together. Oh Jesus, I pray today for all those who are listening to my voice at this time. We all have a different story. We all would love to rewrite aspects of our lives. Some of us would love to go back into our past and we would make different decisions. But we thank you that in our brokenness, in our difficulties, in our hardships, you make disciples of us. We want to endure hardship as discipline, knowing you treat us as sons and knowing when we come to you with an open, outstretched hand, you will tell us what you told Paul, my grace is sufficient. And thank you for the richness that will come out of those difficulties. The things that we would throw and push away become friends to us. And I pray that'll be true for many listening to my voice today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us today, church. 
please continue to follow us on social media and our church website for updates on the exciting ways we'll get to stay connected online as we grow in our spiritual walk and share God's love together. Next Sunday, we'll be hearing from Cheryl Nemhart, speaker, author, and social justice advocate. Cheryl will share her passion in exploring and tackling social justice issues in today's society and the role of Christian beyond the church. Cheryl is currently a co-host on See, Hear, Love, a national woman's talk show on Yes TV. Thanks for being with us today. As we look forward to another great time together next Sunday, we hope you'll continue to draw close to God throughout the week. God bless you.